All right, just adjusting the. Whoop. Oh! Hi, everyone. This is Chris Negline with the Nerd Extravaganza podcast at the Adventure Game Store. And here I have Will Heimark with me, freelance RPG extraordinaire. And we're going to get into what he's working on for 2017. Hey, what's up? Hey, it's good to see you again. How are you? Not too bad. So, what are you working on? 2017 is a, a big, exciting year for me right now. I'm doing a lot of self-publishing materials um, from my uh, overdue Kickstarter Dark, which is streeting very, very shortly, and will it looks like we'll make it into retail stores now. We're very excited about. Yep. And uh, I have a series of DM Skilled products that are on the way for D uh, D&D Five okay. that I'm very excited about. Uh, there's a great series of. Uh, products that are there already that have been very inspirational and helping to understand kind of what that audience is really hungry for so that we're not as DM skilled creators making things that you know might be kind of nifty but aren't actually super useful and it's, so having that community at uh, something like DM skilled to be able to see what products people are putting out is not just eye-opening but it's also it kind of both expands the imagination but also narrows the list of products that I might make so that I don't make something that it turns out there's already 10 of and people are doing it, you know, great, so they don't need another one of those. Uh, and so seeing that community come together and be able to build those products has been really neat. And so I'm excited to, to be able to, to work with D&D 5. Dungeons & Dragons 5 is such a great addition to the game in my opinion and I'm really enjoying playing it when I get to play it. Um, and I have some, uh, a, a setting I've long wanted to make content for for D and D, and so that I've been playing in for years, and so I get to use that setting and do some tie-in fiction off DM's Guild. Uh, uh, maybe do a setting book that's through the open game license, but not on DM's Guild. But do things that sort of communicate to each other, so that the stuff that is suitable for DM's Guild can speak to the uh, other content. But that is the back half of 2017. That is uh, uh, the quasi distant future at this point. I've noticed you haven't mentioned the name of that setting yet. I'm not going to at this moment because I may change the name of that setting and I don't want to be wrong. Oh, okay. Um, and I don't want to say what it is because, it, the, the, uh, to honestly, the, um, the, the elevator pitch for the setting is not what makes it so much fun. Mm -hmm. The execution of it and the, the, the amount of world building, not just the amount, but the nature of the world building that's gone into it, uh, into its content and adventures is really what makes it a delight for me. So. Okay. So what else is going on for you for 2017? Well, let's see. Uh, aside from the fact that we have a large number of adventures coming for Dark, a number of expansions, including the Dark uh, uh, campaign settings, Dark Planet and Dark Net, uh, getting a chance to work on world building kind of across the board is the character for 2017. I have my ongoing uh, Patreon at patreon.com slash wordwill, where I get a chance to do things like write essays and adventures and draw maps for people. Uh, and those essays get posted up for public consumption and public reading at magic-circles.net, uh, which is on medium.com. Mm -hmm. And uh, so those essays about adventure building, world design, narrative design, uh, are contributing uh, in part to things like the DM Skill projects that are coming out of what I've learned and I'm still learning from Dark. Uh, and all of that then feeds into projects I do, like uh, I, I'm an assistant director of a, a teen summer camp for world building called Shared Worlds. Uh, and we're doing that again this year. This is the 10th anniversary of the camp. Um, and the, uh, at Shared Worlds, it's a two-week camp. And the first week, uh, somewhere, depending on how many students we get, it's usually in the neighborhood of, uh, this, um, lately it's been 50 to 60 students. So they break into groups, classes that are nine or 10 people in a class of five or six groups often. Uh, and the first week, they build worlds together. Each, each class builds a different world. And it's uh, held at the campus of Wofford College in South Carolina. So we have access to a auditorium and to classrooms and uh, computer labs and things like that. And during that time, they design a world together that they will all kind of co-inhabit as designers. And then in the second week, they all write stories in that world. And those stories uh. sometimes very much agree and sometimes kind of diverge because the myths of their world might be uh, uh, very varied and diverse and might not all agree with each other. Uh, but so they all write those stories. And then we've had, uh, uh, we have best-selling authors who've come in. We've had uh, authors like Nadia Korfor, uh, Nathan Ballengrud, and uh, uh, Holly Black come in uh, to teach some of the students and to read their stories. Uh, and then they each get a, a formal one-on-one uh, -on -one and a critique with the writer who comes in and says, this is what I love about your story, and this is what I would work on next as a writer, and this is kind of where I would think about uh, pushing the story or working on it in revision. And that fills two weeks pretty handily. And uh, <laughs> uh, that process is 
exhilarating and exhausting and exhilarating again, and it's just a terrific experience. And, and getting to do presentations for that uh, camp is a great chance to hone my thinking on all this uh, uh, crazy, I mean, the gaming and the, the writing and this whole process so that I can rethink how world building and, and storytelling are interacting and then how they're interacting with emergent gameplay and not just this year but last year and then looking forward to next year. And I gotta say by the way, meeting uh, the students of something like Shared Worlds, so and these are uh, late high school kids, uh, generally uh, uh, 14 up until about the summer before they go to college. Um, they get a chance to talk about what they're reading and what they're writing at home and what they're thinking about and any concerns I've had about the fact that maybe there won't be a whole new generation of geek gamers and maybe there won't be a new generation of readers, these kids are all voracious readers. They show just how omnivorous gamers are, how omnivorous uh, uh, the culture is for genre and literature across the board. Uh, they're incredibly sharp kids and they are very inventive and very aware of the processes that go into this sort of uh, uh, work because they're not just curious about it, they can read the tumblers of you know Neil Gaiman and they can read their favorite writers blogs and they can read the about chapters in the backs of some of these books now. Um, so those who weren't gamers often leave being gamers because they come together and play really? play at the camp at night. They stay in dorms and stuff so they get a chance to become gamers at camp and they learn where has this been this whole time. Do they play in the worlds they're inventing? Or we, we do so. My, uh, my game Odyssey I designed for shared worlds so that the kids could play in their shared worlds in their little groups. Uh, and the only thing that we learned actually uh, uh, that got in the way of that a little bit is that we play in the uh, as a big organized game in the weekend between the two weeks and they've kind of just spent six days obsessing over this world so they're kind of less interested in playing in their own world on that day off mm -hmm. than they are in like either playing in worlds that they that they share with all these other students they just met things that they know from from movies or video games or novels or in playing in the worlds that they've been hearing little whispers about that the other groups are making. So we're still, every year I work on different uh, uh, ways for them to RPG, to play RPGs together and learn more about how they all think about world building and how they think about narrative and story and character creation. Um, so we don't, I don't require them to play in their worlds anymore, but it's an opportunity and some of them do and some of them play in, in settings that they know and love already. Or I get that kick that they, or they're more interested in playing in their classmates' worlds. That's right, isn't that neat? That is that that process by which the students, because they're they're not forbidden from revealing their worlds per se, but most of them don't want to yet because they don't know if what's true on Wednesday will be true on Thursday as they're still cooking the worlds and they do presentations for the classes that show uh, what their world is like and they don't want to be they don't want to set up something and then and then decide that it's not going to make the cut of their presentation at the end of the week. Um, but, they're, but the whispers come out and they hear uh, that little themes emerge every year and they're different themes every year. Like we've had, we had a, a year that just kind of was very steampunky in lots of clever and, and varied ways. Uh, but we've had years that were about the nature of reality or, or a year that was all apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic. Um, and it's not by design and it's not discouraged. So it creates a situation in which it kind of reveals what their lives are about right now, what, what they see the world around them becoming or pointing at or what they wish or sometimes they, they zig or zag and they go in the opposite direction and say wouldn't it be great if we all, if we built worlds in which there was no land and it was all sky and we rode flying dinosaurs or whatever. Um, and these kind of questions uh, uh, speak to what's on their mind in a way that lets them not only problem solve but postulate, you know, to speculate about uh, uh, what, what excites them, what, what frightens them, why they don't want to be afraid of it anymore, why they're, or what they're bored of, that they're, that they're tired of the magic science debate, for example, and they say, nope, it's all the same in this world. <laughs> People study magic like they study science and all those sorts of the, the processes. And they're so less beholden to the conceits of genre and marketing because the products aren't, they're not designing a world for sale and they're not necessarily designing a world to prove anything about other things that they've consumed, although they obviously they, they, they get informed and inspired that way. Uh, but their whole dynamic is just so freeform, and because it has to absorb nine or ten different imaginations at once, uh, they naturally come out very varied and diverse. And the great thing is to see them talk about so many things in one world, even as they 
even as these continuities emerge between worlds, even when we see that this year it's all about, like this last year I think I can safely say we had the pangolin kept showing up as an inspirational animal in different settings where people had seen either one student at the cafeteria or something had brought up a picture of a pangolin, which is you know a little kind of armadillo looking thing with overlapping plates, uh, little scales. Um, and so not so much that the pangolin itself appeared in all these worlds, but either like you'd recognize the pangolin nose in one creature in one, in one world, uh, the overlapping scales in another world, and you'd say, okay, so somehow the pangolin <laughs> reached everybody's imaginations this year. I don't know if that's, if Tumblr has to do with that, or Twitter has to do with that, or what it is, where, you know, what the actual vector was for that idea. Um, but at the same time, it never comes out as a thing like, oh, so it's all, it's all pangolins. It's just that you can see these, the genealogy, these threads of ideas coming through. It's really fascinating. So this is where role playing kind of starts going past being just how can I put it a game, right? Getting into like art or a social shared construct of some sort. Absolutely, yeah. Th this am, I, am this I getting a little too oh, too off you know too off, too far in the field for that or like? Well, you're surely not inaccurate. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it, it totally is like that. And what's interesting is to see how many of these kids, as I say, aren't gamers in the first place mm -hmm. and don't realize how much of what they've been doing essentially is either narrative design or contributes to game design. Uh, they've just been, they just imagine they've been drawing worlds in their notebooks and thinking about other places and they just haven't had the need to make it, you know, to set D&D &D adventures there, to draw dungeon maps of it, or to stat monsters. Uh, but they take very quickly to that role-playing feeling of cataloging a world, defining both what is possible but what is impossible, or, or my favorite, what is possible but unexpected in that world. The things that the the rules and the societal conventions and physical or geographical rules that seem solid to the average person in that fictional land, but are actually just waiting to be defied or confounded or revised, because they're looking at it from the top down of how am I going to tell stories in this world, and then even better, how are we going to tell ten stories in this world, each of us one at a time, so that we can say, you know, oh well, no dragon has ever been killed, they've only died of old age, and so, of course, that creates the idea, and this hasn't come up in any particular world, but let's say, that creates the idea, well, what if I write a story about the first dragon to be murdered, or the first dragon to uh, be slain by a dragon slayer, or what have you, um, and so sometimes those, those statements that say, this has never happened, or this is the way it always is, uh, our world building coordinators and the other students are often kind of pushing on each other to say, really, it's never happened, or to say, has it never happened, or... Is it just not known that it's ever happened? Like everybody thinks that this is the that no dragon has ever slain another dragon, but really it's happened a couple of times, and the dragons have been suppressing it, have been keeping that that history secret, and those sorts of questions that go back and forth immediately, right, create story possibilities. The questions of well, how do they keep it secret? Why do they do that? And seeing that be as collaborative a process as it can be with ten imaginations in one room is, on the one hand, really eye opening. It's also a little daunting, uh, but it creates a situation where it teaches, I think, each of the individual world builders to be considerate of, of imaginations beyond their own in a way that just, you know, that drawing uh, on the bus or drawing around your homework and sketching and doodling doesn't always do. Even if you have to supply two or three of the imaginations yourself when you work alone later, you start thinking, well, what about my readers who want to answer this question? What about the gamers who are going to challenge me on this detail? What about uh, uh, the viewer of the art who's going to wonder, why are all these? Why, why don't any of these characters look like me? These sorts of options it makes so it, it leads to a level of consideration, which I mean both socially to be considerate, but also just imaginatively to to ponder the possibilities and take in lots of options and imagine how big and how precise can I make this? How can I make the world feel alive and be big enough to tell more than this one story that I have in mind? So my question is is how can I sneak into high school so I can take your class? I know, right? <laughs> uh, no, I would have gotten, I would have, I would right? have been nuts for this if this thing had existed when I was a kid. And I count myself lucky that uh, uh, we get to do this every year because I learn tons just from the teacher, uh, the the speakers, and the uh, the writers who come in uh, to teach the students. I sit in on all those lectures uh, uh, because I want to hear them too and take notes. We have people who, uh, Wofford College professors, who come in and give. Uh, talks on, on real world biology, like for animal evolution and, and uh, uh, biomes, uh, how history actually, like uh, uh, histories are written, and how you can find wiggle room in a 
fictional history to accommodate multiple accounts. We've had presentations on mapping and presentations on uh, law and morality and religion, uh, in addition to things, uh, uh, presentations that are specifically about the expression of these worlds, like writing or drawing or what have you. It's, it's, it's a thrill. So you mentioned earlier that you've been learning from DMs Guild what players and GMs want. So what are some of those things? Well, in a lot of cases, uh, since DMs Guild either ties into uh, great wizard settings like Forgotten Realms or Ravenloft, uh, what's been most telling to me is seeing how products are being built that aren't necessarily setting specific and aren't therefore specific to particular kinds of campaigns, mm -hmm. but are just about the way that we play. So there are lots of great products that are uh, additional spells and class options and such, and that's terrific, and, and I think we all uh, obviously have room for those in our 5th edition campaigns. But when it comes to questions of things like different modes of play, chase scenes, new options for chase scenes, or ways of doing, uh, for example, to hint at one of the products that, I, that I'm hoping to have come out in the summer, um, giant playable castles that roam the land, things that are massive changes <laughs> to actual gameplay without necessarily plugging into the available sockets in D&D &D 5, but that are, that really kind of change the dynamic at the table, even if they're sort of one-shot opportunities. And so we did an event at a gallery in Chicago called the Co-Prosperity Sphere, uh, called Level Eater 7. This is the seventh annual D&D related or fantasy related art show in the space. And we've played D&D &D there the last couple of years. Uh, and I've been designing and running adventures for it. And this year the adventure was seven interlinked tables uh, and we do this based on this is the seventh one of these so uh, it was a, a being coming to the fantasy setting of the game and fracturing it into seven dimensions and so there's sort of like light through a prism there are seven versions of the same dungeon and so each player at their table is at that dungeon and then they learn that they can communicate with each other through magic mirrors and that they can transmit magic items through those magic mirrors so that they can pass the right item to the right dungeon to beat the boss of that dungeon. But they have to communicate to each other what they want and what they need and learn which weapon beats which boss battle and so forth. And it's designed, of course, to be able to be playable in it's three or four hours. Uh, and the dungeon's a little bit big for that, so not all tables see the same thing, so they have things to talk about afterwards. Uh, but that process then makes me think, what can I do other than just presenting the dungeon map and the, and the monsters and the riddles? Uh, as an adventure. Mm -hmm. And so we're taking all the, the playtest feedback from players and the DMs who participated. And we had fifth, or 46 players, I think, at the end um, total. And I think all but one table beat the monster, and the monster slew the, the members of one table. Depending on how you look at it, I know one table essentially made a deal and drove off the evil monster <laughs> in exchange for being able to take its place. So I don't know if that's a win or not, uh, because they're, they're, they're saying, well, no, we'll have years before I turn evil and try to conquer this land. So maybe next year, at level later eight, we'll see what happens. But it leads into that great opportunity to ask things like, one, I don't know how many people have an opportunity to play something that is like a seven table event, but if people have the opportunity now, they will have a, a, a kit that will help them do that. But it's also just what sort of uh, lessons can we learn from seven simultaneous playtests of the same dungeon and how much of that information then can, can go into the product to be, rather than just honing one expression of the dungeon, mm -hmm. express directly to the DM, we had this happen at two different tables, so if you want that to happen, this helped us facilitate it, this is how we responded to it. Or if you think that's going to be not so much fun for your players if they all get squashed by this trap or that they're afraid to go into that room because the trap is too scary, here's what you can do to make it more inviting, or here's something you can replace the trap with, but to talk really overtly about different parts of the playtest experience, and to be able to report in some cases what different players did uh, in different parts of the dungeon to give the, the, the DM and or other players ideas of things to either try themselves or say, well, it's been done, I'll think of something else. Very cool, very cool. So uh, I think we've run out of time, okay. but it has been a pleasure. Pleasure's mine. Thanks for hanging out with us here at Nerds for Advocates, a podcast and the Adventure Game Store.